as we go throughout our, our, our part of our meeting as we go out th throughout our program this evening uh, stationed in other parts of our building. Um, th this evening, uh, San Angelo ISD is complying with the district's directive um, of 10 or less individuals gathered in one room. So we're still accepting members of the public to attend this meeting and make a public comment if they would like to do so. We have a satellite seating area and viewing uh, downstairs to adhere to, um, to our state and federal policies. Uh, welcome uh, to our regular meeting of the Board of Districts, Board of Trustees of the San Angelo Independent School District. Um, we're also live streaming uh, this session on Facebook as well as our TV channel to help us adhere uh, to and avoid gatherings of more than 10 people, um, again, uh, based on those guidelines. So welcome to our meeting this evening. Um, it's unusual times uh, require unusual steps, and uh, we're all going to be um, interesting to see how our meeting goes this evening, but we're excited uh, to be here and, and uh, celebrate what's going on in uh, SAISD. Um, our first item is to call our uh, meeting to order and establish a quorum. We do have a quorum of our board team. Uh, we're kind of spread out, but um, the only board member not here is uh, Mr. Hernandez, who had um, something come up late, and he's uh, in transit to San Antonio. Our second item on our agenda is our invocation. Normally we have a pastor or someone here to lead us in our invocation. Uh, I'll choose to do that. If everyone would like to pray, we'll do that. So let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for um, the opportunity that you give us to be here this evening. We're thankful for the blessings that you provide uh, for us and our families uh, each day, Father. Uh, we pray that uh, in these um, unusual times, Father, that you would um, give peace and uh, comfort to all those who might uh, have uh, anxiety and worry, Father. Uh, we pray that you would um, be with us here this evening, that we would make decisions that would be uh, best for um, the students, the staff, um, and all those who are uh, working so hard at SAISD, Father. Uh, we're so thankful for uh, the fact that we've been able to serve meals and, and do things for, um, for the students and, and of our school district this uh, last week. And uh, we certainly are thankful for uh, janitors and, and maintenance staff and, and people, uh, and certainly our, um, our cafeteria workers, uh, for being able to um, step up and do those things uh, that really uh, take care of our students during this time of need, Father. Uh, help us this evening to uh, uh, be guided by your wisdom as we make uh, decisions that are best for the students of our district and, and really the stakeholders of our community, Father. Again, we thank you for uh, the blessings that you provide for us um, each day, and we know that um, uh, you're in charge, Father, and uh, we hope that we'll... Um, uh, lean on you during these times. Uh, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And I'll lead us in our pledges. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas flag. One state under God, one individual. It's much better when we have students here. Um, that takes care of items one, two, and three. Um, I'm really looking forward to this part of our meeting. Uh, we're going to move forward to item four, which is our recognitions. And um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Gomez. So Farrah Gomez is going to help us with our recognitions. Good evening, Mr. Lehman, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board. This evening we have several recognitions, and our sponsors have joined in with us remotely through Zoom, as you can see on our screen. We will have each sponsor highlight their groups, and they have a presentation to show as well for their individual programs and their parents and athletes and um, musicians are able to join on Facebook Live to see the recognition. So to begin our recognitions for this evening, we begin with our Central High School cheerleaders and their coach, Matt Eskew. Okay, and I am muted. All right, 
So this year was a great year for cheerleaders at Central High School. They were the UIL state runner-up in 6A Division I, and then they went on two weeks later and won their fifth national title with NCA. So our cheerleaders for that competed on this team were... Um, where are you going? Okay, so starting with our seniors, first off is uh, Isis Camarillo. Then Ruby Randall, and then Carly Wallace. Uh, next up would be our juniors. We have Hannah Gomez, Delaney Grimes, <clears throat> Madison Jackson, Courtney Love. Emily Sanchez, Haley Smith, Hannah Still, Rayleigh Torres, and then with our sophomores, we had Jada Carter, Sydney Edgar, Jill Gersh, Ali Hamby, Kendis Leach, Caitlin Migrants, Adair Robles, Jaden Sawyer, Lila Turner, Haley Wardlaw, and then starting our freshman group, we had Ella Burns. Kylie Fuchs, Ainsley Harper, Kylie Mikowski, Avery Ochoa, Kaylee Roeder, Mariah Tibbs, and Cameron Torres. Sorry, I was going to get in trouble with Jack. My apologies, Jack. Next up, we have our music programs from both Central High School and Lakeview High School. We'll begin with band with our head director from Central High School, Jason Jones. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, I'm very excited to be here and to be able to share a little bit about the uh, Mighty Bobcat Band program. Uh, it's been a great first year for me uh, and uh, and being here and enjoy being a part of this community uh, and being a part of this district. It's been a fantastic district, so thank you to all you guys do. We'll go ahead and get started recognizing our students. Um, but first, without that, um, I'd like to – we go ahead and go to the screen now. Um, I want to say – what an amazing group of band director staff that I have. Um, we couldn't do what we do uh, without this amazing group of band directors. I want to just take a quick second to recognize them. Our associate directors, Mike Berry, Stephanie Dearborn, and Kristen Ellis, and our percussion director, Caleb Leonard, and our color guard director, uh, Rebecca Henry. They do a fantastic job helping run this program. Uh, and it was a well-oiled machine when I got here, so it was really nice to step in and, and work with them. Um, but overall this year, we've had a, a really great year. Um, just to kind of highlight some of the successes we've had, um, our marching season, and you go to the next screen. Um, our marching season, we were we won the outstanding 5A, 6A band at the Big Country Marching Festival uh, in Abilene. We had a first division at our UIL region marching contest. Um, the kids were doing a fantastic job uh, prepping for UIL, which will not happen now, uh, but uh, they were all – uh, doing all the bands were doing great, and um, it was it was really fun to see them progressing over the course of the semester. Uh, and then both of our our indoor color guard and indoor percussion both had one uh, contest they went to 
and both of the varsity groups won first place at that contest they went to. So it was really great. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And there's just a couple of pictures of some of our groups, including our jazz band um, and all of them. They've just done a fantastic job during the course of the year. Um, just to kind of give you an outline of how our individual competition season works. Once we finish marching season, we go into our uh, TMEA all region band process and the solo and ensemble process. Uh, the region band process, students begin working on their, their uh, music in the fall. Uh, and then once marching season's over, we go and compete against schools from Abilene and Wichita Falls, Midland, Odessa in a big, you know, chair test competition. So we had quite a few groups, uh, kids that did super at this. We had five students that qualified for the all region jazz band. We had 10 students that qualified for the freshman all region band. We had 15 students that qualified for one of the 10th through 12th grade region bands. And then we had 14 students that qualified uh, for area and audition for the All-State Band. Five of those were in jazz and nine of those were in concert band. Um, and then also the other thing we can do is solo an ensemble. The students begin working on their ensembles uh, in, in the late fall and they compete for a rating. Uh, we had 74 first division medals, 31 solos, 43 ensembles. And then we had 43 students that qualified for the UIL State Solo and Ensemble Contest. We did a fabulous job. So now I'm going to recognize all those students that have been advancing post district. Um, first, from Region Jazz, had Preston Llewellyn on trumpet, Isaiah Alejandro on trumpet, Ethan Clark on alto saxophone, Natasha Flores Acton on trumpet, and Willow Joyce on trumpet. Next, we move to our concert band. We had Natasha Flores Acton on trumpet, Skylar Rodriguez on flute, Lauren Ochoa on clarinet, Willow Joyce on trumpet, Emily Parks on oboe, Caitlin Wallace on clarinet, Preston Llewellyn on trumpet, Tommy Young on trumpet, and then Caden Hale on baritone. Um, now I'll recognize those kids that advanced to the state solo and ensemble contest. The qualification requirements for this is they have to play a solo from the hardest list of difficulty music, have to earn a first division at the region level. In addition, solos have to be memorized. So all these that earned it on a solo, they memorized it. So on solos, we have Skylar Rodriguez on piccolo. Caden Hale played a trombone and a baritone solo both. He made first divisions in advance to state on both. And Ryan Chavarria on percussion, Caleb Perky on percussion, and Garrett Glover on piano. Next, we'll go into our ensembles. We have a flute trio of Autumn Brewer, Mallory DeWitt, and Gabriel Gutierrez. Another flute trio of Annika Carrillo, Laura Johnson, and Emily Rondin. We had a clarinet quartet of Carly Curran, Dallas Dotson, Mia Flores, and Caitlin Wallace. Another clarinet quartet, Logan Brockman, Melinda Hogan, Lauren Ochoa, and Olivia Rangel. Saxophone quartet of Frankie Coleman, Sean Estrada, Sharia Hill, and Carlos Pena. And we had a flute ensemble of Olivia Allen, Emily Berry, Billy Cortez, Mallory DeWitt, Gabriel Gutierrez, Scotta Rodriguez, and Mackenzie Smith. We had a saxophone trio of Ethan Clark, Megan Combs, and Michaela Wynn. Trumpet quartet of Isaiah Alejandro, Bryce Cummings, Adrian Hernandez, and Preston Llewellyn. Another trumpet quartet of Isaiah Alejandro, Natasha Flores Acton, Adrian Hernandez, and Tommy Young. And then a trombone quartet of Ty Espinal, Michael Estrada, Ashton Hennis, and Joseph Rubio. And last, we had a baritone trio of Brock Packard, Rudy Perez, and Jordan Trigg. And I just want to thank you for all you do to support the Monty Bob Camp Band and all the music programs in San Angelo ISD. Thank you, Mr. Jones. And now we have Lakeview High School with our head director, Josh Bailey. Hello, San Angelo ISD. I'm Josh Bailey, like she said, the band director over here at Lakeview High School. 
want to say that I'm really enjoying my first year getting to work here for such an awesome school district and working with some really awesome kids over here on the north side of town. We have a great staff over here at Lakeview at the high school with uh, myself and Jesse Bailey and then um, our middle school staff, Sarah Clark and Kyle Headstream help us a lot over here as well. Uh, please excuse my sunburned face. We've been passing out instruments all day long uh, to some students over here. We just finished up and then now I get to be in this awesome board meeting and get to talk about our year. So uh, Mr. Jones already explained how the year works kind of in band. And so we'll talk through what we did over here. Um, so the first slide is a picture of our group right after we got sweepstakes at the uh, UIL marching contest. We got our, our first division. Uh, it was a great year, had an awesome show and kids worked really hard for it. And then the next uh, slide, our honor band actually got to go to UIL concert and sight reading this year. We go to the early contest, get it out of the way because the kids get so busy and wrapped up in so many different activities. So we get that done and out of the way. So we did get first division on stage and in sight reading. So it gives us a sweepstakes for the year. Uh, kids were really proud of getting uh, accomplishing that. And then our next slide, um, that's a picture of our indoor percussion group. Uh, this is the first year we've done the marching percussion where we actually move around on the gym floor instead of just standing still. We did an 80s show, as you can tell from the pictures there and the really cool uh, uniforms that we got for the kids. Uh, they really enjoyed that show and we got to go to one contest where we did get uh, second place uh, to a big 5A school. So that was pretty exciting for our, our group. Uh, we also have indoor color guard and they went as well. I didn't have any pictures of them. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, we want to feature our three students who advanced to state solo ensemble. This is a French horn trio. Uh, we have our drum major, Madison Getz. She's a junior. And then we have Jillian Haynes. She's a junior. And then we have our senior, Miguel Diaz. And then this next slide is a photo of our 16 students who uh, qualified for the region band. Um, the audition process and then um, the next slide has all the students who advanced past the region level so they made it to the area level um, so we had our drum major uh, Vanessa Longoria on flute advanced and then Nellie Woodruff on bassoon Andrew Mutka on bass clarinet Madison Getz on French horn Marisol Vasquez on euphonium Gavin Davis on tuba and Noah Rochester on string bass. Those were our advancing students. And then beyond area, you there's one more level you can advance to. Uh, it's kind of the highest um, honor in band is uh, to make the All-State Band. And this year we actually had two students qualify for the All-State Band. Um, so you can see pictured there is the 4A All-State Band down in San Antonio. They got to go and uh, perform a concert with some of the best musicians in the state. and. They had a really great time. We we're really proud of those students. They represented our school well. So this next slide shows those students. Uh, we had Noah Rochester, made all state on the string bass. Noah is an awesome student. He plays just about any instrument that I give him. Uh, awesome kid. And he just um, got into West Texas A&M University's music school. And that's where he plans to attend school. And then the next slide, we have Andrew Mutka. He made the All-State Band. He's a bass clarinet, um, and he's a senior this well this year as well, and he's going to be going to Baylor University. So once again, I do want to thank everyone who helped our school this year and um, supported our band program, especially our band boosters that are out there. I hope that you all are watching, and uh, thank you so much to our school board for, for supporting our students. Next, we'll move to choir. We first have Central High School, Landon Gilmore. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, thank you, administrators and board members, for your leadership during this time. Um, it's certainly a new experience for all of us, and we're thankful for everything that you're doing to still provide these learning opportunities for our students. Um, our choir program, since the last time we saw the board, uh, we competed in concert and sight reading evaluations last April. We took four groups, approximately 200 students. Um, three of our groups uh, were fortunate enough to receive sweepstakes ratings. The concert ladies, Bella Voce and Bobcat Corral, our varsity mixed choir. We also took a JV men's choir, which is a little unusual, but 
um, they got, they were the only group actually, that got straight ones in the concert sub competition from our school. Um, and they came out with an excellent sight reading. Uh, and so we're proud of all those groups and we've got some pictures of them for you uh, in the slideshow, our men's choir. We can go to the next slide. Um, concert ladies group that's directed by Mrs. Vaught. Our Bella Voce group, also directed by Mrs. Vaught, and then the Bobcat Corral um, that we co-direct. Um, this fall, so our all-state choir audition process rolls from May 1st through February 15th or so, when we have the TMEA convention. This music's announced in May, and students start working on that music. They go to all-state camps in the summer. Um, this year, we had uh, 16 students named to an all-region choir. Those auditions occurred in October. Uh, and then we had three students advance to the next round in November with one student advancing onto the area auditions in January. And then the from the area auditions, we had a student, Elijah Jackson, who was a sophomore, who was selected as uh, an All-State member for the tenor bass choir. And we also found out that when he got down there, he was selected as a soloist. So that was a really cool opportunity. We have some pictures over the next several slides of some of the students, students in that process, um, students attending a workshop at Abilene Christian University, um, the students at the region auditions at Permian High School, and then a selection of students that performed in the all region mixed choir and treble choir concerts that took place uh, the first weekend in November at Permian High School. And then the last slide of that bunch is a picture of our sophomore, Elijah Jackson, again, who made the All-State Men's Choir, Tenor Bass Choir, and was selected as a soloist. We were super glad that Ms. Hubner was able to come down and represent our SAISD administration, and she got to see that concert, and that was really fun for all of us and for him. He did an awesome job. The choir sang Amazing Grace. And he sang the solo at the beginning of it and at the end of it with a choir of about 200 guys behind him. So that's a extremely high honor and we're proud of him. Um, this past spring, uh, or this well, the spring that we're in, I should say, in February, we had a regional solo and ensemble contest. We took about 60 students who competed. Uh, 37 of those students were awarded the highest rating possible, a superior rating. 29 of the 37 students um, performed a heart, the hardest difficulty of solo. So that's a class one. And they, of course, memorized that. All vocal solos have to be memorized. And so 29 of that 37 are qualifying for the state contest that we hope is still happening in June. Um, that's typically held at the UT Austin campus, but that's to be determined this year. The next slide is a picture of our group that went to that contest last year. Um, so they, they always look very nice dressed up for that. So our next batch of slides are our individual student recognitions. And I'll just kind of go through these. Um, Caroline Anderson was all region treble choir, first division on a UIL solo and state UIL contest qualifier. Tyler Bridges, a ninth grader, he earned fifth chair as a bass in the all region choir auditions for the tenor bass group. He received a first division on his solo and qualified for state contest. Lily Bright was Alto One All Region Treble Choir Alternate, First Division on the Solo and State UIL Qualifier. Edith Castaneda, Alto One All Region Treble Choir Member. Aaliyah Collins is a ninth grader. She uh, earned seventh chair as a Soprano One on the All Region Middle School Treble Choir. Anaya Dixon, Alto Two All Region Treble Choir Member. Drew Eisenbach, one of our seniors, who's also a Texan member, she alto, she was an alto one, earned a spot in the all region treble choir. She got a first division on her solo and is also qualified for state UIL contest. Camille Fott is one of our sweet seniors that we share with orchestra, and she got a first division on her vocal solo and is qualified for state UIL contest. Christian Fleming, first division UIL vocal solo and state UIL qualifier. Dason Fowler. First Division Solo and State Qualifier. Brooklyn Garza, First Division Solo and State Qualifier. Andres Gonzalez uh, earned 15th chair as uh, base one in the All Region Mixed Choir, and he was uh, First Division Vocal Soloist and State UIL Contest Qualifier. 
Jasmine Gutierrez auditioned for the All Region Treble Choir in Alto 2 and was named an alternate. Bethany Hare, ninth grader, is a first division on her vocal solo. Michaela Hare, her older sister, uh, is a senior. She's a soprano one, was all region treble choir member, earned a first division on her UIL solo and has qualified for state competition. Paige Harris is a senior. This student uh, competed on a vocal solo and a piano solo at regional competition. She earned first division on both of those and has qualified for state for both solos. Haley Hawkins, uh, first division vocal solo and state contest qualifier. Brooklyn Holman, First Division UIL solo. Andrea Isaacs is a ninth grader who got a fifth chair on Soprano One and All Region Treble Choir and First Division solo contest. There's Elijah Jackson again. He had it was he earned first chair tenor one in the region auditions. He placed second in the pre area auditions. That's the second round and fourth chair at the area auditions. So he was a member of the All-State Tenor Bass Choir. He earned a first division on his vocal solo and is qualified for state UIL in June. Taylor Jost, first division UIL vocal solo. She's a ninth grader. Bailey Jowers, first division UIL solo and state UIL qualifier. Carlos Lunar is one of our senior football players. He earned a first division on his vocal solo and state UIL qualifier. Riley Matthews, first division vocal solo. Cambry Morales, first division vocal solo. Caden Martinez, first division vocal solo and state qualifier. Jack McLaughlin, first division vocal solo and state qualifier as a ninth grader. Braden Myers, first division vocal solo and state contest qualifier. Rhiannon Moss, first division vocal solo and state qualifier. Mary, Nor excuse me, Mary Norris, first division on her vocal solo. Luke Oliver earned a first division on his vocal solo and is qualified for state. Hannah Olson, first division on vocal solo and state UIL qualifier. Micah Reynolds, first division vocal solo and state UIL qualifier. Dirk Ross, uh, this is the first time he actually auditioned for region choir and he earned 13th chair, base one. We're really proud of him. Hayden Shelton is a transfer student and wonderful vocalist. He earned a first division on his vocal solo and is qualified for state. He moved here right after Christmas break. He's done a wonderful job. Skylar Smith, first division vocal solo and state UIL contest qualifier. Also one of those students we share with Miss Rocha. Ashley Stapp, uh, first division vocal solo and state UIL qualifier. Sydney Sell, same thing, first division on her vocal and state UIL qualifier. Abigail Stevens received a one on her solo. Our senior Andy Thompson and choir president, she's ninth chair, soprano one, all region mixed choir. She uh, qualified for the pre-region, excuse me, pre-area auditions. She got a first division on her solo and is also qualified for state. Gloria Trevino, third chair, soprano two, all region mixed choir. She was a qualifier and auditioner for pre-area. She got a one on her first, uh, excuse me, first division on her solo and state UL qualifier. And then lastly, Elizabeth Weinman uh, was an all-region treble choir, soprano one. So that's all of our choir students. Thank you so much. Next, we have Lakeview High School, Amy Greider. Hello there. I'm Amy Greider. I'm the choir director at Lakeview High School and Lincoln Middle School. Um, I've got two students to really showcase today. We have Rebecca Heroy, who advanced to area auditions as an alto in the region choir process. And she also scored a division one on the uh, hardest difficulty of a solo at Solon Ensemble Competition. And we'll be advancing to the Texas State Solon Ensemble Competition in June. And then we also have Shay Price, who uh, competed in solo and ensemble with a received a division one on the hardest difficulty solo and will also advance on to the Texas State solo and ensemble, ensemble competition in June. And now, Mr. Rosendo Ramos for Mariachi at Lakeview High School. Good evening, school board. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. And uh, I'm really, really proud of the mariachi this 
this year. We've done a lot of great things. Uh, first, before we even start, I want I want to give a shout out to Mr. Bailey. Uh, we did an awesome uh, little joint venture this past football season where we performed together in the stadium, and it was a really amazing experience for all the kids. And it was really cool to see that unity between us. Um, the Mariachi advanced to the state contest this year for the fourth year in a row. Very, very proud of the performance that they uh, they they did. They represented San Angelo and Lakeview very well, and I'm very, very proud of all the students that, that went out there and uh, did what they had to do. Um, I do want to, if you want to go to the next slide, I want to mention all my students that performed there. Let me check it. On the top row, we have, my apologies. Let's see if I can see here. There's a lot of slides in here, I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. On the top row, we have uh, Fabian Heredia, Belen Hernandez, Demetrio Rios, Jose Saucedo, and Deja Gomez. In the middle row, you have myself, Rosendo Ramos, my assistant, Ezra Ramirez, Daisy Cano, Cassandra Salas, Adrian Mascoro, Alvaro Ramos, Joe Santillan, Jackie Ortiz. On the bottom row, we have Isamari Cisneros, Analia Zamoron, Michaela Torres, Alexandria Flores, Alani Jimenez, Amy Torres, Vanessa Ramos, and Monica Escandon. Very, very proud of these students. And thank you guys for all the support always. Next, we have orchestra, Mrs. Emily Hall Rocha from Central High School. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mrs. Rocha from uh, Central High School and CFC. And my assistant is Michael Martin, a wonderful, wonderful teacher. Thank you so much for all you do, especially during this difficult time. Thank you for keeping us all um, in good hopes. And thank you so much for finding a way to recognize these kids, even though we can't actually be there. Um, this is my favorite night of the year because this is one of the, the times that we actually get to recognize our students outside of our programs for the hard work that they do. I do want to tell you guys about a couple of things that we've done this year as a, an entire orchestra program, but then I want to focus on the kids who have been doing all the hard work. Um, so we, we had more students make all region this year than, than before. Um, we had more kids qualify for state solo and ensemble as well. And we just the, the week before spring break, we achieved our 36th consecutive year of sweepstakes. And we are very, very proud of our kiddos. Um, all of that can't happen without our students and cannot happen without them working hard. And as you can see, um, you're, you're gonna see a lot of really, really great kids tonight. And um, you're going to find out that there are actually um, some wonderful future educators coming from our program. So if you would like to go ahead and go to our first student. This is Erica Eikenberry. She earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Next slide. This is Alexis Cooper, also a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Alyssa Vega earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Ben Crowley earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Braylon Neto earned a Division I at Solo and Ensemble. Courtney Vene, or also known as Coco, earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Ember Bird earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Aaron Labrasser earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Hannah Torres earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Jayden also, also, uh, uh, Gonzalez also earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble, as did Jocelyn Avila. 
Jun Zhang earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble, as did Joy Zhang. Laura Bean earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Marbella Valdez earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Patrick Fuentes earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Rebecca Jacobson earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Rosie Caranco earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Stephanie Espinosa also earned a Division I. Tanya Tai earned a Division I. Now we move on to something a little different. Jacob Garrett, he's a senior. He was accepted into the All Region Orchestra and he plans to major in music education. Madison Carr earned her way into the All Region Orchestra and she actually placed first in the Philharmonic Orchestra. Trenton Welch is a freshman who, was, who earned his way into the All Region Orchestra. Anastasia Bradham earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble and earned her, her way to the Texas State Solon Ensemble uh, competition. Bella Castilleja also earned her way to the Texas State Solon Ensemble with a div earning a Division I. Ella F F Faber did that as well. She's an on so, um, state qualifier. Levi Brody as well. He's a freshman and he earned his way. Logan Lido, a bassist, earned his way to State Solon Ensemble. Skylar Smith, another one that we share with choir, um, earned her way to State Solon Ensemble on both in both orchestra and choir. Camille Fott is another one that we share with uh, choir. She um, was in the All Region Orchestra and she is going to state on with both violin and in choir. Francesca Antelin is a freshman. She in, earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. She's a Texas State Solon Ensemble uh, qual qualifier. She earned her way into the All Region Orchestra. And in uh, this last summer, she performed in Carnegie Hall as part of the Honors Performance Series. Gabby Stobaugh is a was a Division I, um, earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. She qualified for state solo and ensemble, and she was a member of the All Region Orchestra. Harmony Schultz um, also is going to state solo and ensemble and um, made the All Region Orchestra. Talison Carter uh, is a senior. She is a Texas State um, solo and ensemble qualifier. Uh, she plans to major in music education. She's been accepted to ASU and earned the Performing Arts Scholarship, but I also thought it was important to, to um, mention that she has over 50 service hours within our orchestra program this year. So she is she's going to be an outstanding educator. Arabella Dunlap is a freshman. She is a Texas State Solo and Ensemble qualifier. She made the All Region Orchestra and she also performed in Carnegie Hall this last summer as part of the Honors Performance Series. Dallas Dotson, you'll see that he has two instruments in his hands. Um, we share him with band. Um, he qualified for state solo and ensemble on violin, and I, and I wanna say he also did the same in, in band. Uh, he made the All Region Orchestra, and in February, he performed in Carnegie Hall as part of the Honors Performance Series on violin. Dylan Stobaugh is a senior. He's a uh, state solo and ensemble qualifier. He made the All Region Orchestra. He performed in Carnegie Hall in February and he plans to major in music education. He's going to ASU and he earned the Performing Arts Scholarship. Jacob Brody, a junior bassist. It, he qualified for state solo and ensemble. He's an All Region Orchestra member and he, this last summer, he performed in Sydney, Australia as part of the Honors Performance Series. And I just want to mention that he placed first, which is a really big deal. He put us on the map for sure. Kira Porras is, um, she's, a, she's a junior, but she's, she'll be graduating this year. She's a um, state solo and ensemble qualifier. She was a member of the All Region Orchestra. 
She performed in Carnegie Hall in February as part of this honors performance series. And uh, she plans to major in music therapy at ASU. Max Cook is a sophomore. Uh, you might have seen him. He, he does a lot of fiddle um, around San Angelo, but he, he qualified for state solemn ensemble. He was a member of the All Region Orchestra. And I want to mention that he was accepted to play both at Cartier Hall and in Vienna, Austria for um, the Honors Performance Series. He chose Vienna, which would be this summer, and I hope he gets to go. This is Greg Fott. Um, he is a freshman and Greg is very special because he made our top orchestra on both violin and bass. He also made a division one at Solon Ensemble on both violin and bass. He's a qualifier for state on bass and he made the all region orchestra on both violin and bass. Stellar kiddo. This is Jonathan DeAnda. He's a senior violinist. Um, he made a division one at Solon Ensemble. He qualified for state Solon Ensemble. He was an all region orchestra member. He was part of the honors performance series. He also performed in Sydney, Aust Australia. He is a recipient of the TMEA, Texas Music, Music Educators Association um, scholarship. He, um, he, he qualified for area and recorded for state and he plans to major in music education, to double major with music education as one of his areas. He will be going to Texas Tech, and he, um, as I said, he's the recipient of the TMEA Music Education Scholarship. And last but not least, we have Lucas Morales. He earned a Division I at Solon Ensemble. Texas, he, he um, is a state solo qualifier. He was an all-region member, and I should say this is the second year that he placed first in our region. Um, he was part of the Honors Performance Series where he performed in Carnegie Hall in February. Um, he was part of the TMEA Area Orchestra, and he was actually the only student from our region to advance to the second round of judging, and he placed 46th in the state. And that that is a really big deal in the orchestra world. So we're, we're very, very proud of him. He also plans to major in music education. He will be going to ASU and he's a recipient of the Performing Arts Scholarship. Thank you so much for all of your support. Next up, we have Miss Stephanie Infante, Lakeview High School Orchestra. Hi, my name is Stephanie Infante and I am the Lakeview and Lincoln Orchestra Director and this is my first year and it's been a very exciting year. I've had so much fun working with these kids and I appreciate all of your support and I do share some kids with Rosendo and Josh and so I'm very proud for those kids to be able to be involved in all of our programs. Um, I took about 14 kids to solo and ensemble for the first time in the last past years Lakeview hasn't participated and I'm incredibly proud of these kiddos. Um, we had a couple of violin trios that received a, a, a rating of a one, and then I had two soloists, two violin soloists that received a rating of a one, and one of them is Noah Rochester. He started out playing violin with Mr. Ramos and Mariachi at Lincoln, and then um, he moved into the percussion section, and um, last year he played bass for uh, orchestra, and this year he's playing cello for me, so he's very well-rounded, and I'm incredibly proud of him. He is actually going to be um, majoring and as a double bass major at West Texas A&M. And I'm super proud of what he's done and everything um, that Lakeview has offered him. Um, there's also uh, another senior, uh, Isa Maria Cisneros. She is someone that I share with Rosendo as well. Um, she's been a mariachi student since she was in sixth grade. And this year, um, I had the opportunity and blessing to work with Rosendo and his high school students. And I was able to help her with her college auditions as well. And she took her solo to solo and ensemble, and she received a rating of a one as well. She's going to be studying music therapy at um, Sam Houston University. And some of my other kiddos, my concert master, um, Gretchen Bundick, was a part of a uh, string quartet that received a one. And I'm incredibly proud of that. 
Her second violin was Serena Martinez, their viola was Alan Salazar, and their cellist was Noah Rochester. Um, uh, the violin trio is Gabby Flores and Sky Luera and Gabby Flores, Sky Luera, and Crystal Govea is the violin trio that received a one. I'm super excited. Um, I renamed the group to the Chief Chamber Orchestra because the Chamber Orchestra is a small group of musicians. We may be small, but um, these students have a lot to offer, and I'm excited to continue working on and their musicianship into work on the legacy. So hopefully with the years come down with the sixth graders that are coming up now, that eventually that the Chief Chamber Orchestra becomes the elite group at Lakeview. That is my hope and my dream for this program. That concludes this evening's recognition of our music programs. We want to extend our appreciation to all of our sponsors and congratulate our students for their fine accomplishments. Thank you all for joining us this evening on Zoom. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, I think uh, even though we didn't get to see the kids and uh, meet them personally, it was we had an opportunity to maybe find out a little bit more about each student. So that worked out really well, Dr. Gomez, thank you. Um, that covers our cheerleaders and our, all of our musicians. Our next recognition is for uh, someone who's near and dear to all of us, Mr. Wilcox, Jack. So, uh, Absolutely. So for our final recognition of the evening, our communication specialist, Jack Wilcox, was honored with multiple state awards at the Texas School Public Re Relations Association or TESPRA conference, including a Best of Category Award and seven Gold Star Awards. You can see the full story on our SAISD website. For anyone who follows our web stories or our presence on our social media platforms, those are top-notch, high quality as a result of Mr. Wilcox and all of his contributions. He's currently hard at work in our audio video studio, so we're highlighting Mr. Wilcox up on our screen and want to um, extend our sincere appreciation as he's an active and valuable member of our team. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Sure, go ahead, uh, Dr. Della. Mr. Lehman and board and uh, constituents, uh, I just want to again highlight the work of Jack Wilcox. Uh, he continues to do an amazing job for our district, uh, really highlighting uh, all the ways our students are smart and celebrating that, uh, as well as highlighting our staff. Uh, Jack really filled the trophy case uh, for SAISD uh, at the TESPRA meeting, uh, and we just continue to be amazed at the work he does for our school district. Uh, I think uh, as we are seeing tonight in an age of uh, digital learning and uh, digital marketing, uh, I believe the work Jack does is just an incredible asset to, to San Angelo proper, not just our school district. So we just want to thank Jack Wilcox for his continued efforts, uh, and he continues to be a, a shining star for our city and our school district. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, our board certainly echoes that. He's a huge asset to our district. We appreciate uh, him and his patience at many of our board meetings. He uh, gets to stay here and... and uh, and, and sit and wait on us to finish when we're in closed session. So we really appreciate Jack. Um, I'll move forward. That covers all of our recognitions. I'll move forward for uh, approval of our minutes. Do we have a motion to approve? Second. We have a motion from Mr. Gallegos and a second from Mr. Dindle uh, to approve the minutes of our February 10th, 2020 special finance pre-agenda meeting and our February 18th, 2020 regular board meeting. Are there any corrections or additions for any of our board team? Any public comment concerning our motion? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item is item six. Uh, this is reserved for anyone uh, from the public wishing to make comments to our board team on items not on our agenda this evening. I don't see anybody uh, out in our hallway wishing to do that. Um, and we'll also ask for a comment on each item before we um, call for our vote there. Uh, that covers 
Item six, item seven is our reports. Um, these are provided, provided by Dr. McFarland, McFarland in our um, Friday Facts, our student enrollment report for the 24th Monday of school, which was February 24th of 2020. Uh, we were up 45 students versus last year. Uh, so again, we thank the community for um, your confidence in, in allowing us to uh, educate your students. Um, our next item is item B. Um, we're gonna get an update on um, academic progress from Dr. Ritter. As she enters the room. Thank you, Dr. Dutloff, Mr. Lehman, and members of the board. And um, we're excited to just provide an update today to our virtual learning platform that we have rolled out in the district. Um, I will say the last week has been a remarkable one, one that um, in which we have encountered some challenges that none of us have encountered before, right? Uh, from the curriculum and instruction side, it has been um, absolutely, we see it as a great opportunity that we have been able to, <clears throat> excuse me, move forward a digital platform of virtual learning for all of our students, pre-K through 12th grade that we are rolling out. Today was the first day and it has gone extremely well. So I'm gonna give you a, a, a brief review of this. You have a green folder at your places. And so my presentation is the first and then I have some other documents to share with you for you to just take and peruse on your own that go into more depth with some of the components of our virtual learning plan. <clears throat> so in elementary, we are really going with a blended approach. Uh, this week, week one of our platform, we had pa paper packets distributed at all of our campuses. Um, week two and beyond, we know we're, we're trying to move to more virtual learning for all of our students. So I'll talk about device rollout here in a minute because it certainly impacts that. Um, the paper packet distribution has gone very well. They, um, they just had a successful, great turnout. Being able to see the kids the, from a distance and let the families have what they needed to have to move forward with their learning this week. Um, in secondary, thank you. The virtual learning through Google Classroom and Zoom as our platforms started today. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is an expectation for our students to check in virtually through the week with their teacher, and our teachers are also providing scheduled virtual tutorial and support sessions through Zoom, which we've all learned how to Zoom lately. That's how we're doing all of our conferences. That's how we're doing our meetings. That's how our teachers are connecting with their students virtually as well. Um, and as a parent of a high school student who was able to access her virtual learning today, uh, it was really awesome to see that the Google Classroom is, is working and that the kids are also connecting with their teachers. There were about 30 kids in the classroom through Zoom with one of the teacher's tutorial times. And so it was, it was exciting to see and we anticipate that this success is just going to continue. We have had quite a bit of very positive feedback through it, um, along with some questions, and I'll talk in a minute about our communication plan to address those questions. Um, something also to be said here is just to know that as we move forward with this plan, of course, we're learning every day. This is a very fluid situation, and sometimes we're learning things hour by hour, getting updates from um, TEA, um, also from just other sources, we look at other districts and what some of the other districts who are a little bit further ahead in this than us, and getting ideas about what's working. We know that there are questions, you know, like about grading. We're trying to figure all of those things out as we go as well, but we wanna make sure that we're making the right choices. For now, getting our kids with their devices and with their learning and moving forward is our goal and making those connections with their teachers but also to know that um, for both elementary and secondary, our, um, special ed, our special education department is working closely with campus staff to customize individualized plans for our students with special needs. Diane Underwood, who was our director for um, special education and special programs, is getting guidance from 
TEA, which is the Texas Education Agency, on a daily basis, sometimes more than once a day. And we are starting to put, it, put together our plan for that individualized support for our students with special needs. So um, we will continue to work with our campus staff and parents for those individualized plans for those students. Next, with devices and internet access. Um, so all secondary campuses right now are distributing devices to any student needing one. Our goal right now is to start with our secondary students who do not have access to a device at, the at this time. And then we will go from there and see if then we'll move to elementary and determine how many devices we have to move down into elementary. And some of our elementaries have enough also, and they're starting uh, distribution as well. Every campus has a little bit different plan, which is fine because they're gonna need to customize for the needs of their families and their students and parents, but it's happening. As a matter of fact, today we know that we, about 1,200 devices were distributed just from yesterday and today with the campuses that have already moved forward with that. So it's happening and um, it's successful. There are some questions again. Um, those are things that we ask people to just contact their campus. The campuses are extremely supportive and they have the answers to help the families with that access. We will be, um, like I said, assessing the, the inventory that is remaining and completing elementary distribution through next week so that we can move forward with more virtual in elementary as well. Uh, as you've probably heard mentioned before, we have 23 buses stationed in locations around the district to provide internet access hotspots. We saw lots of students out there today using the hotspots spread out and they were accessing those spots. Our goal is that we're working with vendors to um, get some personal hotspots that can go to homes. So we're working on assessing the need for that and securing those devices as well. So um, with communication, just a reminder that as questions arise, which they will, as issues arise, which they will, we ask the first point of contact for our families be the campus, the campus first, to call the campus and the campus principal. You can email the campus principal. There are people on the campuses that are checking the voicemail and our principals are checking their emails regularly throughout the day and we'll get back with you. <clears throat> Also, our teachers. With elementary students, the class dojo is proving to be very successful as a tool for communication and for distribution of information. And Google Classroom, the most important for secondary, and that's the vir virtual platform that they are using for their instruction right now. Um, we also have, just for information, Facebook Live sessions by our curriculum and instruction department every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at three o'clock. So we finished our second one of those today. And we're looking at those questions that people are submitting through the session, the live session. Then they can also go back and reference that video and it's recorded on our district Facebook page and they can post questions to that as well. And so then when we have the next session, we answer the questions that came through from the previous session. So that seemed to be helpful today. Um, Phones are also being answered on campuses again, leave voicemail, principals are checking messages, and we also are sending updates through Swift K-12. I think parents have been very pleased to see that those texts go out on a regular basis with updates for them to have more information about what we're doing in the district. Another area that I just wanted to highlight is our social emotional context. Um, we are currently developing a social emotional learning platform to support the needs of our students and families. We understand that this is a very stressful time, um, unprecedented stressful time for many, many people in our community. And we are here to support. Our campus counselors are available. We ask that you call your campus. Um, teachers are setting up virtual groups so that students can connect with classmates through the Zoom. And um, that's already starting to happen. And I think our kids, you know, just need to still feel connected. That's why it's so important for them to get onto the Google Classroom and connect with their teachers. Um, also, just if your own children are experiencing high stress and anxiety, we're here to support. Just call your campus counselor, and we're certainly here to support you through that. And lastly, we look at this as an unplanned opportunity to grow. We know that today an estimated 7,000 plus students logged into their virtual learning platform. That's pretty remarkable. 
Um, the things that we do see that we know our learner profile attributes are being met, that we see things like our, our students connecting globally, exhibiting flexibility and adaptability, that they certainly are sharing responsibility for their collaborative work, and that they are showing perseverance and resilience in challenges. And this is, these are all attributes in our learner profile. So even through these challenges, we feel we are helping our students and we're helping them grow. Also, our educator profile, that we have teachers showing this resiliency, compassion, challenging existing, existing ways of thinking, and really doing what they can to establish and build a collaborative culture, even if it's virtually. Our teachers and our principals and our staff, um, we just can't say enough about how hard they have worked to put this all together and to make this happen. We're very, very proud of this virtual learning platform. We think it's a model for other districts in the state. And um, we just appreciate everyone's support, including all of our families out there. Um, the flexibility, grace, and compassion that we all have for each other through this time is so appreciated. And um, we know great things will come as a result of working together to meet the needs of our students and families. So thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks, Dr. Ritter. Questions for, yes, go ahead, Amy. Not a question, but um, I just wanted to thank you so much for you and your team, so much for all the work that you've done. Uh, my kids logged in today and were so excited to see their teachers and talk to their friends on the Google Classroom. They were, they were able to talk about their experiences on spring break and what they've been doing. And um, it was just so great to see them excited about that. And I also wanted to um, just really um, acknowledge the teachers who wrote letters to their students and did videos on Google Classroom. Um, watching them was just heartwarming. Just really, they were so excited to get a chance to talk to their students. And it's really what education should be all about. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, Dr. Deloff. Mr. Lehman, board, uh, I just want to recognize the, uh, the work and the efforts of our curriculum and instruction department, uh, leadership of Dr. Ritter. Uh, they deployed quickly. I, I refer to them as the National Guard of Academics. Uh, <laughs> when we uh, received information that uh, this may be a possibility, uh, the team was gathered quickly, uh, remotely and in person. Uh, working uh, feverishly to try to make certain that uh, the needs of our new learning platform met the needs of kids. So uh, I just want to commend your team, Dr. Ritter, uh, and I believe on page three and four of one of your stapled packets in the green folder, there's a list of many of the team members' names uh, that helped with this endeavor. So uh, I just want to highlight our leadership team and also uh, those members of our staff uh, that made this uh, become a reality. It was incredible. I also want to uh, uh, kind of extend on Miss Amy Mazelle Flint's comments as well, that I think we are feeling earlier today what our teachers are feeling uh, without kids present. So uh, it was hard to go through those, uh, uh, our earlier recognitions without the students, uh, you know, seeing the human spirit alive and well and in front of you. Um, so many of our teachers are going through that and, and kids as well. And I just think uh, in kind of regards to Amy's comments, that's why it's so critical for our teachers to connect. And I've just been so proud of, uh, of being a team member here when you see the many video videos that are posted on social media outlets, uh, having my own, uh, having my own daughter in the school system the uh, teachers that are reaching out to them and just providing that connection, which is so critical during a, a period of crisis. Uh, so I just want to thank our, our leadership team, Curriculum Instruction Office, uh, for creating a, a robust virtual platform that I believe, uh, as I've indicated via social media before, that I believe 100 years from now, historians will look back and they will profess that this event, this crisis, will change the delivery of content in the health industry, education, and business uh, as we see it. So it's uh, challenging and exciting times and uh, uh, proud to be a part of this community to, to buckle down together and, and see it uh, through, the, through to the other side. So thank you. Thank you, and Dr. Detloff, you reminded me because I meant to point out what you had in your packet, and I forgot. So I'm glad he brought that to my attention. So in your packet, you do have the Secondary Virtual Learning Handbook. It's an example of the virtual learning handbook that we 
that we created for, this is the secondary one. We have the same one for elementary, just with the specifics for elementary in there as well. But this would be a great way for you to just kind of look through and familiarize, your, excuse me, familiarize yourself some of the details of the plan, or as people have questions for you even, this might be helpful. Um, this here, uh, the, the checklist is a teacher checklist. It's just one of the examples. We had one in secondary, one in elementary. For the two days last week where we had the teachers working virtually in their virtual PLCs, this is the work that they were doing and completing to get ready for this week of instruction. So that is included in there as well. And lastly, um, an at-home daily learning plan example for elementary. So you can see an example of this was created by our team to give as an example a model for our elementary teachers and all of them just took off and created their own and customized them and we're seeing all kinds of great stuff out there in the district. This is an example of what those teachers are putting together, what they put together for this week. And then as I say, we move more virtual into elementary. That is also blended in here as well. So. That should give you some an idea of some of the work that, that we've done. So uh, we appreciate your support so much. Thank you. Other questions for our comments for Dr. Ritter? No, Thanks, I, Jana. We appreciate more, Go ahead. Gerard, I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Jana, for, for, and, and Dr. Detloff, for all of y'all staying, uh, staying ahead of the, of the game, of, the, of this whole thing. I know what, three weeks ago, y'all were already looking at, at um, how, to, how to approach all this. And... Um, I know y'all were meeting, and I think I've had two kids, two or three kids that have told me, why didn't we do school like this before? So, I mean, a lot of them have been really receptive to it. And those they kids have. know, they know how to get on this stuff. It's just amazing how, how quick they adapt. So, and I'm glad y'all were there to lead the way. Y'all have done a wonderful job, and I can't say enough. I mean, it's just, y'all have handled this very well. And I am very, very proud of each and every one of y'all. I really am. Thank, Thank y'all. Thanks, Gerard. Um, other comments, questions? Certainly an, an unplanned opportunity to grow. I think that's a, a, a great way for us to uh, end this. And, and thank you for all your hard work and our team's hard work. And it's, it's uh, really enlightening and encouraging for us to watch, you know, our team's work as we move forward. So uh, it's still a learning process. And um, as Dr. Ritter pointed out, if if we've got problems or we've got issues, then take those to the campus. And we're going to work through those and make it uh, – as, as, good it can, as good as it can possibly be, maybe even better. So thank you. Sure. Uh, just one more question. Um, and I know it's still a learning process, so I, I don't know if you have a plan for this yet, but a few people have asked me how attendance will be counted. So will that be by logging in every day, or how does that work? Um, so it's a challenge to say the least, but we do know that with secondary, that is one thing that is, when they're using their Google Classroom, the expectation is that they're logging in every day. Their teachers are checking in with them. We also have the ability to um, go in, I think Mr. Underwood and Ms. Huddleston today did some virtual learning walks because we have access to the virtual classrooms. We can go in and see and make sure that teachers have their lessons going, um, that there's response. We can see exactly how many students have logged in and checked in, even from our end. But principals are doing that, so there's a lot of oversight and just checking in. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, also, we have, through Mr. Underwood and Ms. Huddleston, a principal Google Classroom. So the principals are the students in this Google Classroom setting, and they're the instructors they're putting in there certain things to remind principals to do. So all of these things are reminders that we give our principals through that virtual um, platform as well. So it's this constant cycle of checking up. If we find that there are students who just are not surfacing and are not checking in, then that's when we're going to figure out how we need to make a direct connection. And we have staff on hand to, to do that. We're working on that right now, but really we've had a great response. And so far, so good. Um, as far as actual attendance, we know that we can count our state attendance if we are showing that we are doing what we can to provide instruction to our students. Um, it's just a little bit of a challenge to check to see every day what they're doing, but, but we are working on that, and it's that communication with our parents is imperative. So we just encourage all of our parents to really do what they can to make sure that their students are definitely logging in daily to their Google Classrooms. Uh-huh, thank you.
And hopefully yes. they'll do more than just log in. They'll, um, yes. they'll spend some, we want to see spend some, time <laughs> some <there>. work. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that um, concludes the report section of our agenda. Um, um, our next item is item eight. Our consent mm -hmm. items, uh, consent items A through C. Do we have a motion to approve those? Motion to approve consent items A through C. We have a motion from Dr. Kingman and a second from uh, Mr. Parker uh, to con to um, approve our consent items. Uh, item A's donations, we have those listed on the board. We appreciate um, especially the Glenmore uh, jet pack boosters. I think that was, that was a pretty significant contribution. We appreciate that group. Um, item B's consider approval of our quarterly investment report uh, ending uh, February 29th of 2020. And item C's to consider our cooperative purchasing organizations uh, both those items were uh, discussed at length at our pre-agenda board workshop, uh, which was last Monday. Uh, do we have any comments or questions, or would anybody like to pull any of those items prior to our approval? Any public comment? If not, all in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item is to consider our bills, accounts, and financial statements for the month of February 2020. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion from Mr. Dindle and a second from Dr. Kingman uh, to approve our bills, accounts, and financial statements uh, for the month of February 2020. Do we have any board comments or questions concerning our um, motion? Mr. Lehman, just to note to the public that we've reviewed all these reports in detail at our pre-agenda meeting last week. And in addition to that, all these reports can be found online at our website, SASD.org, uh, under the Fiscal Responsibility uh, tab. Thanks, Mr. Dindle. Um, other questions or comments concerning our bills, accounts, and financial statements? Any public comment? If not, all in favor of our motion, please ind indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item is item 10, consider proposed amendment uh, to the district's official budget um, in, in our general fund. Do we have a motion to approve? So we have a motion from Mr. Dindle and a second from Mr. Gallegos uh, to approve uh, the proposed amendment to the district's official budget. This is an uh, budget a, uh, uh, expands uh, our expenditures or um, uh, by five. I got to get to that page. Sixty-six. It's a move of five million dollars dedicated from our dedicated fund balance to our general budget, as that we outlined during budgeting in August. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Kingman. So that's for HVAC uh, project at Lincoln and Glen, um, the Diedrich and Diedrichs and Jim concessions project, and also purchase orders uh, that were rolled forward um, um, at the end of the year. So um, that um, totals uh, five million five hundred twenty-five thousand six hundred and three dollars. Any other board comment or questions? Any public comment? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next uh, item is to consider superintendent's recommendations for 2021. Uh, these are our administrator's contracts. Those were included. Uh, Ms. Hopkins included those in our, um, in our board packet today. So does anybody have any questions about any of that? Do we have a motion to approve? Move to approve the superintendent's recommendations for 2020-2021 administrator's contracts. Thanks, Mr. Parker. We have a motion from Mr. Parker and a second from Mr. Gallegos to approve um, superintendent's recommendations of our administrator's contracts for the year 2020-2021. Uh, Any board comment or questions concerning our motion? Any public comment? not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item is a new item, and uh, Dr. Gomez is here. We're going to move 12, and then we'll, um, we're going to move 21 to this same area. Uh, we're going to consider employee compensation uh, during emergency clo school closure. That's item 12. And then item 21 is uh, consider resolution regarding delegation of temporary purchasing authority to the superintendent. Um, Dr. Gomez, are you ready to do that? Yes, Dr. McFarland is also joining oh, okay. us. I'm sorry. If that's okay. Okay. Sorry, Dr. McFarland. 
I forgot y'all were hiding back there in the kitchen. <laughs> you have the full resolution. But we want to highlight a few pieces for you this evening. This in, is in regards to our COVID-19 school closure compensation plan. Some background is the district determined that closing schools from March 16th through March 20th, 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, was in the best interest of the students, staff, and community. The school closure is anticipated to remain in effect through April 10th, 2020. The district should make determinations related to compensation for all employees during the emergency closure of school. We have a DEA local policy that guides us on pay during closing. During an emergency closure, all employees shall continue to be paid for their regular duty schedule unless otherwise provided by board action. Following an emergency closure, the board shall adopt a resolution or take other board action establishing the purpose and parameters for such payments. Pay during closing per the board resolution that each of you have. Beginning on March 19th, 2020, the district entered a period of modified operations, which shall continue until at least April 10th, 2020, during which time all regular employees shall be compensated at their regular, hourly, daily, or salary rate of pay according to their regular duty schedule and regardless of whether the employee is performing services remotely or on site. Per our board resolution, the compensation plan recommendation states the board determines there is a public purpose and benefit to San Angelo ISD to continue to pay employees during this period of modified operations due to the closure of Texas schools and the declaration of a public health emergency. The board hereby authorizes the superintendent to return to the standard employee compensation structure at such time as he determines that normal operations may be safely and lawfully resumed. Dr. Gomez, may I add to this as well? Uh, this is in uh, constant communication with the Texas Association of School Boards and our legal counsel. Uh, unfortunately, every district in Texas is faced uh, with this issue. Uh, but I just want to thank Dr. Gomez uh, and Dr. McFarland uh, for consultation with the Texas Association of School Boards, as well as our uh, Walsh Gagos Council uh, as well. So as our board is considering these resolutions, uh, I just want to provide that background information as well. Thanks, um, Dr. Detloff. Other questions for um, Dr. Gomez? So we need a motion to approve a resolution of the Board of Trustees. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution addressing the employee compensation during emergency school closures. Thank you, Mr. Gallegos. Do we have a second? Second. A second from Mr. Dindle. Um, any other board questions or comments? Um, it's nice to be able to... Um, continue to provide uh, compensation for our employees during an uncertain time. Um, many in our community are not um, privileged uh, to do so, so it's nice as a school district for us to be able to do that. And uh, a lot of our workers are working uh, maybe harder than they ever have. Um, and uh, certainly this relieves a little tension and anxiety uh, for those folks. So um, if we don't have any other comment. Do we have any public comment? Dr. Detloff. Mr. Lehman, I just want to take this time to thank our San Angelo ISD Board of Trustees. Uh, you all have had the willingness the entire time to make sure that we do what's right for our employees, uh, and we are grateful for that, and uh, our entire staff, educators, uh, and every department is grateful for that. So uh, we sincerely appreciate uh, your wisdom and guidance uh, through this event, and uh, we also are, are grateful that uh, you want to make sure and ensure uh, that our staff continue to receive compensation uh, for their work, whether that be virtually or physically. So uh, thank you for, uh, again, looking out for the, uh, the needs and, and wellness and overall 
uh, health of our community and school district. We all know that and all believe in this room that uh, public schools are the cornerstone of our democracy and uh, we believe that it's the uh, bellwether of our community. So uh, thank you for uh, guidance and support in this uh, initiative. Thanks, Dr. Detloff. Any other questions or comments? Any public comment? If not all in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item is that we move forward, as I mentioned, is consider resolution regarding delegation of temporary purchasing authority. And Dr. McFarland is going to cover that for us. Thank you, Mr. Layman, Dr. Detloff, members of the board. Appreciate this opportunity to address you. Um, on the previous topic, just real briefly, one of the items that, that is typically asked in, in the district with continue of pay with employees is, is can we afford to do that? Obviously, that, as the person who's over finance, that's a question I get. One of the things I want to assure the board, and first of all, again, thank you for your action there to take um, measures and action to take care of the members of the San Angelo ISD um, employee bank there is that the budget is budgeted for a number of days for employees. So that money is budgeted for. We don't get funded on the amount of days employees come to work. So understand that that money is budgeted for. And as Dr. Detloff had mentioned, with our communication with legal counsel and communication with Texas Association of School Boards, and uh, even through the commissioner's updates regularly, um, the understanding is that the funding revenue stream will continue to come through these districts. So that money has been budgeted for to pay people um, regardless if they're here physically or regardless if they're work, work, working remotely or whatnot. So those things are in plan. Um, as you well know, um, I again appreciate you uh, and your patience with us getting this on the agenda in a late form. It came to you as an emergency agenda supplement. And it's a purchasing plan that, again, in association with conversations with TASB and legal counsel, that many, this is very common of what districts are doing because they're experiencing, obviously, during this fluid time of change in our school system, they're experiencing expenses and purchases and needs that they previously have not had before. And um, as y'all have seen with our curriculum instruction department and the opportunity they've had to roll out such a tremendous um, uh, platform for our students and, and, and try to meet the needs there for our learning of our individuals. Uh, a lot of those things come into play with, with, with a need to get those things in place quickly. Uh, as you well know, CH local policy uh, identifies that there is a $25,000 limit of purchasing that anything that the superintendent wants to purchase above that amount comes to the board for approval. Uh, that's in our own CH local policy. Along with CH local policy in association with that is Texas Education Code 44.031A, which basically addresses the um, limit of 50,000 and the procurement, uh, procurement processes that go along with ensuring that we're in, in legal guidelines of making sure that we go through the bidding processes and those things that are required by the state of Texas. Both of these are mentioned here because this resolution uh, proposes to you that there is a temporary suspension of following local CA, or policy CH local and Texas Education Code uh, as mentioned here. Um, so per the board resolution, the board uh, determines that the district's best interests are served by delegating authority to the superintendent to procure negotiate and contract for good services uh, beyond the amounts dictated by CH Local and Texas Education Code, which are required to respond to district needs caused by COVID-19. And the neat thing about this one that we talked lengthy about, uh, that's a little different than what they're doing for other districts, is we, because we value the oversight of this board and want our continued input on the, the financial uh, stability and the financial direction of this district. Uh, this is a resolution that basically goes into a week and can be revisited weekly. Okay? So uh, as the resolution, resolution is written at this point, uh, the requirements of CH Local and Section 44.031 of the Texas Education Code will be reviewed weekly at the board's virtual meetings. 
um, in order to determine either the continuation or cessation of this practice of allowing the superintendent to approve those purchases beyond $25,000. Thanks, Dr. McFarland. That's a, um, um, for adding that. That's important, and, and certainly as it's outlined in um, in paragraph four, it says we'll report all the superintendent will, will report all purchases of goods and services under this resolution to the board, and will present to the board budget amendments and subsequent ratification of contracts entered into under the authority of this resolution as soon as reasonably practical, uh, practicable. So you know we're we're going to be updated on a, on a consistent basis, and we're only doing this a week at a time currently. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mr. Layman, I just wanted to, to add to that. It's not a coincidence that uh, under our board's direction uh, for 17 consecutive years, we've received the highest marks in the state financial system for financial integrity. Uh, so I appreciate Dr. McFarland for adding uh, this second point uh, because we certainly uh, wanted that oversight and the checks and balances that are provided by this second bulleted item uh, with our board. Uh, we believe that if we reviewed that on a weekly basis, uh, and certainly communication would be continuous and ongoing, uh, but it would provide you all uh, the determination to, to cease or continue uh, this practice during a, an emergency closure. So uh, we appreciate that guidance and want that guidance, uh, and it has worked extremely well for the last 17 years. So we uh, appreciate that, and uh, we will also uh, later on in the uh, Becky Hopkins segment, uh, making, making sure that we schedule uh, some upcoming uh, weekly virtual meetings. Uh, if we don't need those meetings, we can always uh, cancel or postpone, uh, but having them um, on the agenda uh, and posted uh, would help us work through this uh, emergency situation. Thanks, Dr. Detloff. So I'll, make, I'll move that we approve the resolution regarding delegation of temporary purchasing authority to the superintendent. Do we have a second? We have a second from Mr. Parker, so we have a motion from Mr. Lehman, second from Mr. Parker. Do we have any other board comment or questions concerning a resolution? Uh, just, just that. If, if you look at bullet number three, it does state that um, the suspension of these requirements, CH local and section 44.031A, that they will continue, uh, continue until at least March 30th, just to let the, the public know to March 30th, and then afterwards, um, we will commence weekly virtual meetings, continue and revisit the district's needs. So, so this is going to be going to March 30th, and we want to go further. Then we can. Like, would we revisit it? Would we revisit it again, or just at our virtual meeting? At our virtual so, meeting. Yeah. Okay. Right. And and you know, at, at some point in time, we may determine at our virtual meeting that we extend it to two weeks rather than one week. But it's you know because it's um, kind of an emergency agenda item this evening. It makes sense for us to do it a week now, and then we'll we'll make determination as a board team later. So. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Thanks for your comment and question, Gerard. Any other questions or comments from our board team? Any public comment? If not all in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Thanks, Dr. McFarland, Thank for you, bringing Lord. that to our attention, and uh, we'll look forward to working through this together. Um, item 13, consider the official appointment to the Board of Trustees of MHMR Services for the Concho Valley. Uh, I think these are um, appointment of Board of Trustees filling positions as Ms. Mazel Flint helped us with at our pre-agenda. Yes. Well, I actually need to recuse myself from this oh, that's part right. because Thank you. Um, I work for an organiz or a program with the, of MHMR. That's why we yeah. left it on the um, agenda rather yeah. than moving it to consent. So um, Ms. Mazel Flint um, will not vote and um, will not take part in any discussion that we might have on this topic. So we'll wait for her to leave before we make a motion to approve. And then we'll recover her shortly. So do we have a motion to approve uh, the appointment of Board of Trustees to the MHMR services of the Concho Valley? Good, great motion, uh, Gerard. Uh, thanks for your second bill. Um, so we have a motion from Mr. Gagos and a second from Mr. Dindle uh, to approve 
the, appoint, the nominees as, as requested by the liaison representatives to provide a duly constituted board of trustees as required by Texas laws regarding mental health and mental retardation. Is there any other board comments or questions concerning our motion? Any public comment? Not all in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. We can maybe recover Ms. Myself Flint. Next week she'd have to sign out and sign back in. <laughs> yes. And Ms. Hopkins, you did indicate that the vote was 6-0 instead of 7-0, and we'll welcome Amy back. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 5-0, because Art's not here. 5-0, thank you. So uh, we'll move forward to item 14, which is considered bid number 20-002, which is transportation radio uh, project, which has handhelds uh, and uh, radios for our buses. Uh, Ms. Mr. Henry is here to help us with that. Thank you for having me here tonight. Currently, the San Angelo ISD Transportation Department is using an analog radio system that is, is outdated and does not offer the clarity or distance needed. Transportation submitted a capital request to replace all analog radios with new digital radios for their department. An RFP was, was prepared for all necessary materials and labor to complete the install. We received two quality bids for this project. A scoring committee was assembled and Texas Communications of San Angelo received the highest score. The administration recommends contracting with Texas Communications to install new digital bus radios for the total cost of 47,750. A contingency of 10,000 will be added to this price for any unforeseen changes. Do y'all have any questions over the radio project? Questions for Mr. Henry? This is another item we um, discussed in detail last week, so I'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve the transportation radio project handheld and bus radio allocation. Second. Thanks. So we have a motion from um, Dr. Kingman and a second from Mr. Dindle um, to uh, contract with Texas Communications to install new digital bus radios. Um, at a total cost of $47,750 with a contingency of $10,000. Any other board comments or questions concerning our motion? Any public comment? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Thank you, Jason. We'll move forward, uh, Mr. Henry, to our uh, new restroom and concessions bid at um, the Diedrichson Gym at Central High School. During the budgeting process, the board identified five projects to pursue during the 1920 school year. One of these projects was the renovation of the restrooms and concessions at Diedrichson Gym. This facility opened its doors in 1958. While the, while the same bathrooms have serviced this facility for 62 years, they are too small and are not ADA compliant. KWF Architects of San Angelo, in coordination with Central High School and the Athletics Department, designed a new bathroom layout that will not only increase the size and number of bathrooms, but will also add additional room in the lobby area. Two alternates were added to this bid. Alternate one was for a new wheelchair lift platform. This will not only add a larger handicap lift to the home side, it will also assist maintenance in moving floor maintenance equipment onto our new playing surface. During the bidding process, a sewer backup identified a sewer pipe that needed to be replaced that feeds the uh, current restrooms. It is also an original 1958 pipe. Specs were created and sent to companies that perform this type of work. We received four quality bids and one no bid. A scoring committee was assembled and Hinthorn Commercial received the highest score and the lowest, or yes, the highest score and the lowest price. Their bid price of $1,048,000 includes a $75,000 contingency. The district committed a million towards this project with the remaining coming out of unassigned fund balance. The administration recommends contracting with Hinthorn Commercial for the renovation of the central D gym restrooms and accepting both alternates for the turnkey price of $1,048,000. 
Thanks, Mr. Henry. Uh, questions or comments concerning um, this project? Do we have a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve the uh, administration's uh, recommendation of contracting with Henthorne Commercial for the renovation of the central D gym restrooms and accepting both alternates for the turnkey price of one million forty-eight thousand. Thanks, Mr. Gallegos. I'll second that motion. So we have a motion from Mr. Gallegos and a second from Mr. Lehman. Um, and quality bids, all of them are really close. So we, I think it's um, uh, proof positive that you know we did a good job in the bidding process and uh, had some great contractors that that were really close in in, in their in their costs. So. Kenny Frankie Architects did a great job of pounding the pavement, making sure we got plenty of contractors that had planes in their hands and wanted the project. So yeah. I want to thank them. That's good. Thank you. Can I, just real quick, sure. Jason, what's the time frame on this? When all of these projects are supposed to finish by August. By August. Right now, we're uh, the way that this one's planned. Since uh, spring sports uh, won't be affected, mm -hmm. we're going to go ahead and start this project anyway as soon as we get approval. Okay. Good question, Gerard. Other questions? Um, if not, do we have any public comment concerning our motion? Um, all in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Uh, our next items uh, consider RFQ number 20-01. Uh, this is for stadium turf and track resurfacing at San Angelo Stadium. Mr. Henry. In 1956, San Angelo Stadium was built and later expanded in 1963. In 1964, photographs of the stadium were featured in an exhibition at the Muse Museum of Modern Art in New York City as an example of modern engineering. In 2003, the stadium grass was removed to make way for new turf. The life expectancy for this turf was eight years. Nine years later, in 2012, we, we replaced the turf with our current turf surface. Since the first installation, the use of San Angelo Stadium has continued to grow. The stadium not only hosts football games, but also hosts high school soccer games, band competitions, high school track, and district celebrations. The community uses the facility for events such as Little Olympics, City Rec track meets, YMCA Super Bowl, and Kids Marathon, just to name a few. With all of the use of the stadium, it is now time to replace the turf and the track surface. Not only are the surfaces showing wear, but the track does not have current UIL markings and advances in turf technology will, allow, will also decrease the possibility of injuries. Requests for quotes were sent to eight vendors, three submitted pricing and one submitted a no bid. A committee was assembled and the responses were scored. Hellas Construction received the highest score. Their price of $1,080,931 includes new matrix turf surface with helix technology, a 19 millimeter shock pad underlay for safety, and ecotherm infill to reduce field temps by as much as 20 degrees, and a new Q3000 full pour track surface. The administration recommends contracting with Hellas Construction for the replacement of both turf and track surfaces at San Angelo Stadium for $1,080,931, which includes a $50,000 contingency. Additional costs will include project management by SKG Engineering. Do y'all have any questions over that project? Questions from our board team? When are they <laughs> and where are they starting this pro Well, what's this the timeline on this one as well? Currently, we're, we're slated not to start it until after spring football. So once spring football is over, then we can start. And they're supposed they are to have it completed no later than August 1st. So regardless of whether we have spring football or not, they'll have it finished by August 1st. Right. Right. So I'll make a motion on this. I, I will make a note to our audience that uh, Hellas Construction was here last week and gave a very impressive um, presentation for us and brought uh, samples of the product and uh, we had a, uh, a good visit with Hellas Construction. So I'll move that we uh, um, approve administration's recommendation contract with Hellas Construction for the replacement of both the turf and track service at San Angelo Stadium. 
which in, uh, for a price of $1,080,931, which includes a $50,000 contingency, and also project management by SKG, SKG Engineering. Thanks, Mr. Parker. Second. We have a, uh, a motion from Mr. Parker and a second from Dr. Kingman. And thanks, Max, for your comments. Certainly an impressive uh, presentation last week from Hellas Group. And, and um, I think turf has come a long way. You know, it's interesting to see as, as we progress with um, artificial turf and um, the way they control temperature and uh, reduce injuries and things like that. I think we're moving, um, we're moving forward with uh, as good of a surface as we can get. So thank you all for y'all's work on that. Yeah, I will point out for the audience is that uh, it was mentioned by Mr. Henry briefly, but this has a different type of under uh, pad that is uh, will help with the concussions uh, that we haven't had before. And for those that have gone to the game and see the, all the black, uh, when someone's tackled, it goes up with little pieces of black rubber. That's, that is now being replaced with a different uh, product uh, that's um, that's better than the black uh, little rubber balls that were so we won't see any of that anymore so. they all they also give us an eight-year warranty on the product right the uh, the turf has an eight-year warranty and then the uh, the shock pad actually has a 25-year warranty and uh, they said that when we replace the turf we won't have to buy the shock pad so the next time we do it the price should go down don't write that on the wall. No. <laughs> so, and if I'm not mistaken, that I think the turf is, a, is a, this is the same as the Cowboys turf. It is. It yeah. is the same turf that the yeah. Cowboys have yeah. on their state. Okay. There's several NFL teams that have it. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Any, bo any further board comment? Do we have any public comment? If not, all in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Thanks for your work on that. Next is uh, consider special ed software replacement. Um, is Miss Underwood? Okay. Thank you, Miss Underwood, for your patience again for waiting patiently in another room. Welcome. No problem. Welcome. This is regarding like I talked about at the last meeting. Pull your mic down a little bit. So, yeah. Okay. Is better? Yes, much better. This is regarding the special education software replacement. And at the last meeting, we talked about the purpose of that. Uh, during our TEA audit this year, it was recommended that the district move to a different IEP system. There were legal and issues related to the current system. Um, also, the current system has not been updated in a few years as it is rolling out and not going to be replaced, so it will be obsolete in the school year. Uh, if we use a different IEP software system other than PowerTool that we're currently using, then we'll have to change also our 504 software system. Um, we are seeking to do that as well. We are looking for a software system that supports the whole child. IP 504, all of their needs. That is aligned to Texas laws and idea compliance. Um, we received two quality quotes for this software. Both companies met the specification and program features. And the scoring criteria was applied. Frontline technology received the highest score. Uh, it was fairly close in, in looking at the qualifications, um, but Frontline, we are already using that um, for our absence management system, so it's something we're already we're already using. It also um, this IP software is used in over 85% of the state. Um, the people that they have on staff are familiar with Texas laws, so the compliance issues are, are not an issue with this company. If something changes in this. In the legislation, they update the forms automatically, so we're automatically in compliance. Um, it offers elite technical support uh, via online support services. Um, they also um, offer a, 
uh, transfer capability, like I mentioned before. So if a student moves into our district that is coming from another district that also uses Frontline, it's a simple um, transfer of records and we immediately know how to serve this student from day one, not waiting on records to be sent to us. Um, this system also offers a 504 program that we're looking at also purchasing. There are other programs, RTI, EL, LPAC, that could be considered later on, but currently right now we're looking at the IEP and 504. Um, it is the administration's uh, recommendation to approve the Frontline Technologies Group to implement the new IEP and 504 software for the two-year cost of $88,986.92. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mrs. Underwood. Questions for um, you, you Gerard? We're getting, we're getting this to implement the I, was it IEP and 504, and you said we can, I guess, add other stuff to that? If we choose to eventually use some of the other programs for, um, like, our English learners, uh, a way to document those services, currently right now we're just looking at the IEP and 504, but there are options later on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Thanks, Gerard, for that. Other, any other questions? If not, do we have a motion to approve? Move for approval of the uh, special education uh, software replacement uh, for two years at a cost of $88,986.92. Second. Thanks, Mr. Dindle. We have a motion from Mr. Dindle and a second from Mr. Parker. Any further board comments or questions? Thanks, Ms. Underwood, for the great job you're doing in, uh, with our uh, special programs uh, and, and implementing this program. So thank you for bringing that to us. Thank you for approving this. This will yeah. be great for our district. Okay. So do we have a motion to approve? Do we have um, any public comment? All in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Our motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shelly is back there, so Ms. Hullahan's going to come forward and uh, update us on these many, many uh, TASB Board Update Policy 114. Shelly. Actually, Mr. Underwood did a fabulous PowerPoint presentation at the pre-agenda meeting, and I understand that um, probably you put this on the um, um, agenda, not on the consent agenda, because of BED Local, and obviously that was one we pulled off of the um, TASB policy because you all had a um, meeting with our attorney and really that was that one is designed for you all our our board so do you do you have a question on that one or do you, I need to get Mr. Underwood out here to answer any of your questions no not that I'm aware of uh, okay um, we are changing our audience participation policy a little Correct. bit and uh, um, if anybody in um, that's watching this or someone that normally comes to our board meeting since we don't have much of an audience this evening if they want to look at this new policy it is BED local yes sir and uh, we're in making every effort to include um, our public and, and allowing them to participate in our meetings uh, we do um, have some safety and guidelines that allow us to um, whoever's leading our meetings to make sure that we stay on task and we don't have um, you know too many comments but this is work that we've been uh, doing with our um, our attorney um, at Walsh Gallegos and um, and I think it continues to um, a long-standing tradition which is one that where we believe in, uh, in in allowing the community to come to our meeting and, and take part in our meetings uh, and at the same time not control our meetings Correct. so I think we've worked hard on this policy and and our board feels pretty good about it Mr. Lehman, I'd like to add also that our legal counsel indicated that San Angelo ISD has one of the most open, transparent policies in regard to public comment across the state. Uh, so I, I think that's been um, really held in the high standard uh, for many, many years that uh, we want to hear public comment. I think for us, it's just the organizational piece of that is uh, certainly having uh, individuals sign up, approach the podium so that we can make sure we record their public comment and also that we have a chance to get all the information and respond in a, 
in a timely manner to that uh, comment. So again, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, we've had an open, uh, very transparent uh, public comment policy for many, many years, and I appreciate our, our board legal counsel and, and senior cabinet members for uh, working to, to craft uh, the policy that you've presented around uh, our board and team's desires. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Goff. So any further board comment or questions? If not, do we have a motion to approve? Um, I, I will make a motion, um, but I did want to ask one thing. It doesn't have to do with public comment, but um, do, are our pre-agenda meetings, uh, I know they're usually scheduled on the second Monday, but do we ever change that? Have we, have we, can you think? I know there's sometimes that we uh, have moved our meetings to a Tuesday or the next week or so, but is, have we ever done that with a pre-agenda meeting? Yeah, I think, I so, think occasionally we have a school holiday or something like that. Okay, well, let me, let me point out something then okay. that uh, maybe we need to amend it. Just on the first uh, of BE, local, BE local, it says regular meetings, and it says pre-agenda meetings of the board shall be on the second Monday of each month, and regular meetings shall be on the third Monday of each month. But then there's this one sentence that says, when determined necessary and for the convenience of board members, the board president may change the date, time, and location of a regular meeting with, pub, with proper notice. But I think that should say change the location of a, uh, I mean, the date, time, and location of a pre-agenda and, and slash R regular meeting with proper notice. So we, you catch. can do both. Yeah, that's a good catch, Mr. Parker. Yeah. With that said, I move that, um, wherever it says right there, that we follow administration's recommendation that the board add, revise, or delete local policies as recommended and as indicated in our, in our packet by TASB Policy Service and according to the instruction sheet for TASB Localized Policy Manual Update 114 with that one amendment that I just mentioned. Thanks, Mr. Park. Do we have a second? Second from Mr. Dindle. So we have a motion from Mr. Parker and a second from Mr. Dindle to uh, consider TASB board policy update 114 uh, with the, that one amendment to BE local. Other questions or comments concerning our, uh, um, our motion? Any public comment? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed indicate, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item. Um, we worked on last week. We have a uh, resolution for Region 15 Superintendent of the Year. Um, I mentioned at our pre agenda board workshop that uh, I had the privilege of judging, um, voting for uh, the Region 15 um, recipient of the uh, Superintendent of the Year last year. And while those two gentlemen that were uh, were highly qualified, I felt like we needed to uh, um, showcase our superintendent and. Uh, Ms. Hopkins gave me a letter this evening that she's worked on, and uh, I think we're a little bit ahead of the process, so we're, uh, we've got that ready. But tonight we'll need to approve a resolution uh, that allows us uh, to do that. So um, that is um, item 20 on our agenda. Do we have a motion to approve our resolution? I'll make a motion to approve the resolution to nominate Dr. Carl Detloff as TASB Superintendent of the Year. So we have a motion from... Mr. Gallegos, and a, and a second from Ms. Mizell Flint. Any other questions or comments concerning our motion? The resolution's real simple. It says, Nasal Independent School District Board of Trustees on this date, March 23rd, 2020, resolved to nominate Dr. Carl Detloff, Superintendent of Schools, for exemplary, his exemplary and visionary leadership toward improving student performance in our schools. Uh, and we'll all need to sign that resolution. So uh, do we have... Any other board comments or questions concerning that? Any public comment? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Hopefully, uh, we'll um, see Dr. Detloff on the stage at a TASB meeting. Our TASB TASA uh, joint um, convention uh, in September. That's Assuming we have convinced you. That's right. Yeah. Now, Max, <laughs> um, we did talk a little bit about um, um, another meeting, a, a virtual meeting. Um, what's the what's the 
everyone's desire on that. Yes, sir. Mr. Layman, uh, members of the board, uh, during a, really this unprecedented time of having a national and state and global emergency uh, crisis, um, we believe that if we would schedule our virtual meetings, which uh, again from legal counsel and Texas Association of School Board recommendations, uh, we have guidelines uh, for following a virtual meeting uh, platform. Um, much like our, our students and, and teachers are doing. So uh, I would uh, offer to the board under your, your guidance uh, that we potentially schedule uh, every Monday for the next month at least uh, with a virtual meeting. Um, and then uh, certainly we can postpone or cancel that meeting if we needed to. But I think providing it on the agenda uh, provides us an opportunity to meet virtually. Uh, there's a couple of different platforms uh, that many school districts board teams are utilizing to do that. So uh, we would want to help support that endeavor, uh, but that is at your discretion if you think our board team would like to schedule a, a weekly virtual meeting at least the next month time period. Well, we've um, delayed or canceled school till the 10th, right? So that, that would be the 13th. So maybe um the third thirtieth which is next Monday, the sixth and the thirteenth. That's three weeks. I don't know if we do we need to do it for a month if we do it the for is the pre agenda. Yeah, we have a meeting then anyway. Would we, yeah, so, so we wouldn't need a virtual meeting if we have a pre agenda. Uh yes sir I, I anticipate we would. Uh certainly we'll gather information on a weekly basis. Uh but I think I don't know, this is again, uncharted territory, but I'm guessing that is it our prerogative that we post a meeting and then it is our choice to go virtual or have a physical meeting? I'm I, just- I would think that'd be the case as long as it's posted right. you know, legally. And certainly we'll use guidelines from uh, CDC, uh, Governor Abbott, and just kind of play it uh, by your weekly have the pre-agenda posted, but maybe it's scheduling these three additional virtual meetings up to that pre-agenda. That's, that's at your discretion. Do, do Mondays at 545 virtually work, work for everyone? Is everyone in a spot where they can make that work? I think that it's okay with me. I, question I have, and maybe in your discussions with DEA and the TASB and others, or have there been discussions about whether uh, we'll be able to con uh, continue or, or be able to have virtual meetings for our regular meetings or our pre-agenda work? Yes, sir. Both. Yes, sir. Both. Both are possibilities. And. Um, and I assume they'll find some way to work it out, but how do you have uh, public comment at those? There's a, a couple of ways to do that. What we understand through the, a platform that is utilized across the state, uh, as well as in our, our academic work, uh, is the Zoom platform. Um, I understanding, my understanding from Zoom is that uh, the dial-in feature works best for public comment. So uh, on the posting, we would have a dial-in feature for that public comment. Um, but I might defer to someone that has a little more expertise in that area. Uh, Dr. Gomez, I think you're the ninth person in the room, Dr. Gomez, so <laughs> you may enter. That is correct. It would be specified in the posting how the public would be able to um, join the link for the meeting and the procedures for public comment would be specifically outlined. Yeah, that's assuming that this board member is smart enough to figure out how to get on it, you know, so I had some trouble getting on it today. So You, you would not be the only one. <laughs> so I got on, but I couldn't see Farah or anything. So <laughs> and she couldn't hear me. I could, you know, so other than that, it was fine. But if I'm, I told her if I'm going to lead a meeting on, on Zoom, then I, we may just let me be gone and let Max take care of it. 
we are prepared to help coach all of us that's good. Uh, we'll need at the closure we'll of this meeting tonight. Okay. That's good. I'll need some coaching. We do have one other item that we haven't covered, um, and that's um, we're supposed to do the superintendent evaluation, contract, and salary. Uh, so we're going to go into closed session and uh, uh, be back uh, shortly following that discussion. Let's, um, we're returning from our closed session. We um, went into closed session um, under Texas Government Code 551074. I'm supposed to have announced that prior to us doing that. Um, but that allows us to discuss personnel matters, which certainly applies to us um, considering the superintendent's evaluation contract and salary. And uh, um, we are um, going to announce tonight that we're um, the board wants to extend Dr. Detloff's contract by a year. He has a three-year contract, uh, so we want to extend that another year, which is the, our, um, how we normally do that. Um, that gives uh, him confidence uh, from, from our team, knowing that uh, he can build a plan and, um, and uh, we're not going to uh, pull the rug out from under him in the next year or two. Uh, so that's – and then we also um, – our motion would be that we're um, – going to extend his contract a year and also that we're going to give him an increase in pay that's commensurate with um, those uh, that are um, similar to that that uh, our other administrative senior administrative team members get and um, that covers our motion certainly our board team is very satisfied as it uh, should be indicated by the fact that we are nominating nominating him for superintendent of the year uh, we're very satisfied with his performance um, and um, I think every indication um, this week alone, the fact that we fed over 6,000 students um, last since school's been out, um, um, you know, he's led that um, initiative and a number of other initiatives for us uh, from a curriculum standpoint and the things that we're doing uh, to try to deliver uh, education to all, our, all of our students and pretty challenging uh, for the type of socioeconomic conditions that exist in San Angelo. So um, lots of great ideas from our administrative team. And, and I think as our board team discussed, we've got a really fully engaged um, administrative team. And I think that's a, a clear credit to uh, Carl and his leadership ability. So we're uh, really happy with, uh, with what's going on in our district. Uh, we're, as a board team, um, certainly um, have high expectations for student performance. We know that our, um, our, our uh, administrative team, our teachers, our, our bus drivers, you know, everybody's uh, expecting our students to perform at, at the highest level. And uh, we as a board team um, expect that, and we're uh, proud of the steps we've taken this year. Uh, but we know those are just steps towards success, and uh, we're looking forward to having leaps of success rather than just steps. Um, so I think that's uh, um, Carl's done a good job of leading us in that area too. So those are there's several different criteria that we uh, evaluate our super superintendent on. Um, one of them has to do with his relationship with us and the community. I think that, that it couldn't be any better uh, as far as that uh, is concerned, and um, the safety and well-being of our students, the fiscal um, how uh, sound are we fiscally. Uh, those are things that we uh, are included in uh, Dr. Detloff's um, evaluation. And um, in nearly every case, uh, we feel really happy with what we're doing there. And we're going to all work collectively to make sure that uh, we um, continue to improve student performance. So I'll, that's a long motion. My motion is that we um, um, increase, uh, we uh, add a year to Dr. Detloff's contract, and then we uh, give him an increase in pay that's commensurate with that, that we we'll make a decision on later uh, for uh, similar administra senior administrative staff members. So that's my motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Mr. Dendle. So we have a motion and a second. Do we have any further board comments or questions? Or um, If not, all in favor of motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. And that concludes our meeting. So uh, hearing no objection, we'll stand adjourned.